podcast. We got Roland Martin on the set. I am extremely privileged. I cannot tell you how much we bow down to this gentleman. He is the epitome uh, of what I think is the news anchor um, of news anchors. And uh, I can I tell you how blessed we are. Look, he's still good. He's still good. He's still good. He's still good. But he here, he he here, he here. What's up, Roland? How's it going, man? It's absolutely awesome, man. I'm so elated, man. To have a conversation with you. This is like a dream come true. Uh, well, I want to make sure we good with audio. Okay, there we go. All right, cool. Audio is good. Uh, we are here, so. Ooh, glad we glad we finally got all that stuff straight. Uh, <laughs> I was sent a Zoom link and not the hop in link, so I'm like, I'm like, we're not on Zoom, but it's all good. Uh, so we straight, we're here, so let's roll. Man, you got it, man. So thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. So um, I invited you, man. I, 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 you know, we're launching our new company. We, we just launched. We had a beta test. We came out on. We started on January 15th, Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday. And uh, we just believe that, you know, he died fighting for civil justice and social justice. I mean, he lived fighting for civil and social justice, but he died fighting for economic justice. And so since right. we represent a company that we're fighting for economic justice and we're closing the wealth gap, um, we picked his day to launch or do our soft launch on. And so mm -hmm. now that we've been through our beta, we're now launching our company. And I said, well, you know, I wanted to bring Damon John on, but I said, well, who is the epitome of freedom that I could think of? <laughs> and uh, I heard you tell, actually, you was in the pulpit. Now, I, 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 I didn't know you was a preacher. I don't know if you are, but you took a text. No, 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 no. I'm not a preacher. My, my nah, wife was, no, nah, nah, you took no, a no, let, let, let me clear. My wife went to seminary. She's got papers. <laughs> She's been ordained for 25 years. Uh, she was the first staff, first female staff pastor at Brook Hollow Baptist Church in Houston. Uh, I'm bootleg. Uh, so, so she's official. <laughs> She's official. She got papers, all that sort of stuff. I'm bootleg. So, uh, but yeah, if you ask to, um, if you ask to speak uh, in a pulpit, you might want to bring a text with you. Uh, and um, so, yeah, uh, but, but I, I can't, I can walk through uh, the text a little bit. I can do that. Oh yeah. You did it too, man. You, you did it. I got a, I got a four year degree in seminary. My mom's in the room. She's a pastor. Uh, my dad's a pastor. My sister's married to a pastor. My brother's a pastor, and I know preaching when I see it. So your <laughs> your wife might have the papers, but I was watching you, watching the text and illustrating it. And I don't. You can call it what you want to, but you're a preacher. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I'm bootleg. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> so listen, in that sermon, you you told a story, man. It, it really blessed my life, and this was years ago. That's how impactful yeah. it was. To, with them. So it's such an impactful moment. I've been teaching financial literacy and, and intelligence for quite some time. And um, you told a story. You were talking about um, when you were asked to retract a statement from CNN. And you said that you had morals and values that you really believed that the statement that you said was true. And that to take it back would be, would be to go against your morals and your values. And you said that I did not have to do that because I'm free. You said I'm debt free. I'm financially free. And so now I can stand on my morals and my values as a man because I'm free. And it stayed well, think, with me. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no. It stayed with me that long, man. I said, well, when we start talking about freedom, I said, man, I remember this sermon um, or this speech or this, 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 this uh, what what you call it I exegesis of the text <laughs> um about your freedom um you want to elaborate on that a little bit I, yeah i think that um for for many people we really don't understand freedom uh in the song glory uh common has a line and he and i were talking about this where he says freedom is like a religion to us so when we talk about freedom, um, it, it has has a lot of different meanings, and and I think when we talk about um, uh, spiritual freedom, we talk about uh, there are some people who believe in sexual freedom, there are some people who believe in economic freedom, 
but, 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 but freedom really means the ability to be able to move throughout this space and be free to make decisions that for you are important and you are not you know moving forward that you are walking in confidence with what that position is when i think about economic freedom economic freedom means that i am able to make decisions in my life as to where i want to go what i want to do and i am not being shackled by other things so when you have economic freedom, when you when you do not have debt, what happens is you say, you know what, um, we're moving back home. You're not thinking, I got this job, man. We got mortgages. <sighs> what are we gonna do? You know, because, because so what happens is that mortgage is shackling you. It is preventing you from making a decision that is fully free. It is, it is, it is, those things are preventing you from being able to move about that credit card debt. You, you I mean, I got to watch what I say at work because, you know, man, I got I got $18,000 in credit card debt. If I lose this job, man, well, uh, how am I going to pay the debt off? And so economic freedom means that you could say, yeah, we're going to leave. But, but what about that job? I'm good because my stuff is already taken care of. And so, that's really where, how I sort of operate in terms of that freedom. And what people don't understand is when I, when I say consequences, there are consequences. I tell people all the time, you know what? You could go, you can aspire for that huge house and things along those lines, but it's stuff that comes with it. But if I'm living within my means, I'm not worried. That's not, that's not, ooh, man, how are we going to pay for this thing if something happened to one of us? Well, that means you are right there. You are already living above your means. And so that's what I think is hurting so many of us. And, and, and I know somebody who's watching and listening, they're sitting there going, oh man, that's, that, that's, that's real easy for you to say because of where you are now. But see, you can't talk about where I am now if you don't talk about where I was. Yeah, say it again, man. I, I, I mean, what people don't understand is when, when in 1999, you need to understand it. God said, leave everything mm. i was married to a television anchor i was in news i could have walked out of that divorce easily three four five hundred thousand dollars god said leave everything my lawyer my alpha brothers my blood brother who's my alpha brother they all were like doc i had to go spoil we have a good friend of mine uh, i went to i was in houston this house in dallas I stayed there for four days playing golf, fasting and praying because I was like, God, you tripping. <laughs> I ain't a wait. He said, no, no. He said, I want you to, he said, leave everything. Now, and this was about this by trip. He said, now I'm going to take you lower. I was like, whoa, hold up. Now we got to go lower. <laughs> Yo, I have real conversation. I said, well, we got to go lower. He said, we're going to go lower. But yeah. And so, so in it, and, and we did go lower. 99, get divorced. 2000, cover the Democratic National Convention. Appendix ruptures. In the hospital five days. No health insurance. While I'm in the hospital, car that I Toyota Forerunner, I had leased it, but I, it already died, but I owed on miles. I had no ride. It was it was repossessed from the court while I'm in the hospital. All of a sudden, I'm dealing with that. Now I've got the, now all of a sudden, I go to 2004, carrying that freelance job that was promised to me when I got my house in Dallas, 99, moved to Dallas back in January 2000. The dude, not a phone call. I still know his name, remember his name, and he get the side eye to this day when I see him. Uh, I had the uh, all of a sudden my whole in 2004. 
I'm going to foreclose on my house. I then filed for bankruptcy. I'm going through this period where I went lower. He's like, I got you. Trust me. We going somewhere. So when I come out of that, get job, blackamericaweb.com, then get laid off after two and a half years. Then, of course, go through another year in the wilderness, get hired the Chicago Defender, 2004. All of a sudden, uh, of course, CNN comes along in 2007. I was able to pay off all of the bankruptcy. Now I'm in a situation where now I pay, now I pay off the house that they were going to foreclose on. Ah, say it again. But, say it again. But, but, here's, but here's what something happened. Something happened when I was going through a freelance check came in man look i had to cash the check but it was like dude this wasn't even a conversation to keep the lights on i called spud couldn't reach him. my boy matthew hart reach him uh i could not reach anybody i had to get to the bank so here i am august texas hot like hot i gotta walk to the bank probably 10 12 miles round trip man i get home my legs are throbbing i'm in pain i'm like god i am not happy with this situation he said did i i'm telling y'all I, i'm honest he said look i said i ain't mad at you i got a problem with the situation how do i have this education how do i have this knowledge and i'm applying for jobs i'm not getting them he this is exactly what he said he said I told you I was going to I was going to supply you. I said, oh, not working. Can't reach friends. Legs killing me. <laughs> <laughs> and this, dumb, straight up, this was the answer. Do your legs work? Mm. I said, yes. I said, yes. He says, I told you I will supply your needs. Wow. I'm like, yeah, you really had to go there, huh? But the point is, I go through all of that. So when I come out of that, no, we ain't doing credit cards. I'm paying for stuff in cash. No, we're not doing that. House gets paid off. The house that I paid off that was going to get foreclosed on, my parents live in that home. My sister and her child live in that home. So the house that was going to get foreclosed on now houses three generations of my family. By them now living, by them now living rent free in that house, they now are able to live differently financially because they now have rent or a mortgage because they're living in a particular home. So the point of economic freedom is, I, my wife and I, we can make decisions where we want to, what we want to do, and we don't have debt as preventing to make decisions in TV ended in 2017. While Alfred Liggett is talking to me, explaining why he's canceling the show, I don't flinch. I am already preparing Roland Martin Unfiltered. As he talking, I go meet with my senior vice president. She's in shock. She's like, are you okay? I said, I'm fine. She's like, I can't believe what just happened. I said, I'm already ahead. Bro, it literally was eight, 10 minutes ago. I'm in this, I'm already there. While I was at TV One, I was purchasing equipment mm. for this day. While I was there, I had spent 200,000 on television equipment while I was there because I was preparing for the day when it was going to end. And then they offered me a new deal and I said, I'm not gonna take it. My agent was like, Roland, Josh, look, take it. I said, no, I can't take it. I said, I'm not gonna take it. It was like, yeah, dude, this 300,000 on the table. I said, not gonna take it. Here's why. Because, because it wasn't the money. It wasn't the money. I knew they didn't have anything for me to do. So I was gonna take a check, but I was gonna be frustrated because I had nothing to do. I said, there's election coming up. What happens when I want to do something? I could not do anything. What I'm trying to get people to understand is the, f the economic freedom allowed me to walk away from that offer to be able to, to accept another offer down the road. That's freedom.
that's deep. Yeah. What you just said, I mean, it's about 15 different points I could have took about that thing. Uh, but the first thing that I heard you say was that most people have the ability to be free, but they choose to be in bondage. Oh, absolutely. We do. We do. At least economically, we, anyway, based on that. Oh, we do. And, and it's our decision making. You see, and again, I, 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 look, I love my mom and my dad. That My dad used to do something that drive me crazy. My dad would talk about if I was rich. Here's my whole deal. We not. So why are we talking about this? Here? <laughs> no, seriously. Seriously. For me, for me, I, I, I'm about to say something. And I know it's about to sound weird for everybody who's listening. You have to be content and ambitious. Mm. Okay, I know that. I know somebody's like, that's an oxymoron. No, no, no. Content means that if I don't do anything else, if I don't get another large home, if I don't have a bigger business, if I don't get a new car, if I am not able to buy my wife another ring or a necklace, I am content with the life that I have. But I am still ambitious in terms of pursuing my dreams for me and my family. Man, so, if I, so if I don't go higher than where I am right now, okay. I have had an amazing life, but I am still working hard. As Tyler Perry told me when he and I were talking, he said, you want to be rich, you got to work like you're poor. I'm still working hard. I'm still trying to build such so build beggar. But if I don't get another contract, if my company stay right here, I am content and happy with what I have built. What did it take for you to get there, Roland? Because I mean, what you just said, it almost sounds like an oxymoron, but uh, the way you broke I've, it down, it's a necessity. I've, I've always, and I know, I'm, and I'm telling you, I know, I literally, that was the case when I was young. Like, well, like when my dad would do that, and again, this is no shade on my dad. I'm like, I know what he was thinking. He wanted more for his family. But for me, I was sitting here going, I hear you, but we have a lot more than other people have. So my whole deal is, so I, I am appreciative of what I got. Growing up, this actually happened. I was 16. My parents came, my brother's birthday, November 13th, born 67. I'm November 14th, born 68. We're one year, one day apart. Mm. My parents came home, birthday gifts. And it was like, it was like a pair of Jordan jeans, two polos and a belt. Now, designer jeans, two polos, very expensive. Y'all, this really happened. I go to my parents' living room and I say, hey, the bedroom, I say, hey, I appreciate this. But I know how much these Jordache jeans cost. So y'all can take these Jordache jeans back and get me three Levi's. And you could take these two polo shirts back and just get me five polos with no polo logo for the same amount of money. Oh, wait, how old were you? I was about 15 or 15. My parents looked at me like I was crazy. Because here was a deal. I didn't care what nobody said or thought about me. With some, you ain't wearing Jordan's jeans. You ain't wearing polos. Because I don't care what you think. I didn't care about 10 shoes that were high priced. Oh, uh, man, uh, you ain't the latest Converse? No, but guess what? They still 10 shoes. I can still run in them. My feet still fine. I don't give a damn what y'all think about designing my stuff. I didn't care. I didn't care. Man, look, I saw a car once a year. I don't care how I look on the outside. I'm driving it. <laughs> co workers like, I can't have a dirty car. I said, dude, I don't care what anybody thinks about a car. It, I don't even see the dirt. I get in. Draw to work, get out, go to work, get back in. It's nighttime. Hell, I don't see the dirt. Home, do repeat. I don't care. I, I grew up not caring what about designer stuff, not caring about Nike, not caring about the latest fashion trends. I'm like, I don't care because that don't make me me. So you, I was content with what my parents were able to give me and I walk in full confidence and full authority, and I walk in full prosperity 
because I knew to be prosperous was not the assets that were on your ass. So, with that being said, though, so I, and I'm with you. I, I'm I'm right there. And with I know you. some church folks like I can't believe you said that, but y'all know ass is in the Bible. So <laughs> Listen, we got we got some saved and not some saved people in here. It's okay, Roland. <laughs> so, um, but what you just said, so I, I'm 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 going to sneak a word in here too. My my mama and my bishop in here. That's my other daddy. So, uh, and my other mama in here too. So, um, I, I think that in our community we suffer from brand whores. That is that if it don't have a brand label on it, I can't wear it. And we become literally whores to name brands while our pockets are suffering, our accounts are suffering, our children are suffering, our portfolios are suffering, our retirements are suffering, but we still look good. We were rather so into, and you said something, you said it was about, you said you walked in full confidence. And I think that honestly, when I think that when we look at the psychological condition of black America, man, I really think we suffer from low self-esteem. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that's 100% correct. I mean, that, that's, I mean no, no, we do. No, seriously. Um, if I, I don't, man, I got like a thousand books around here. If you read, Dorothy Cotton was the only woman who was in the, who was in the inner circle of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's SCLC. She was over there, a citizenship education pl program. When you want to join SCLC, you had to go through her program. Um, in reading her book, it blew me away and I wish I had done that before I interviewed her. I interviewed her in February 2018 uh, around MLK 50. Her last sit down interview, she died in May of 2018. Mm -hmm. But in the book, they talk about when you went through her program, they, they tested you to see if you need to be reprogrammed. You Tell could not, you could not just join the SCLC. They assessed you to determine whether you need to be reprogrammed. I have long stated that there, had, there should be a massive reprogramming of black America. We, when, we, when it comes to the goods and services, absolutely, we feel good because, we, because we've had so much happen where we don't feel good. Something gives us that feeling. I feel better. So how how the car makes me feel and how the Louboutins make me feel and how, uh, it, and we can go on and on and on. I spoke at a Chamber of Commerce event in Houston and they had a live auction and they had a piece of jewelry that went for less than a thousand dollars. Y'all, I'm about, y'all about to really trip out. The piece of jewelry, which grows in value, depending upon the cut and all that stuff, sold for less than a thousand dollars. It was a necklace. Right after the necklace, it was a black team of commerce event, my apologies. After the <laughs> necklace, because that, that's important. After the necklace, they had a custom made suit. The custom made suit went for $1,500 in the live auction. Here's the problem with that. The necklace I can pass down. The necklace I can resell. The necklace I can give as a gift. The custom suit, I'm the only one who can wear it because it is customized only for me. So which one is a smarter financial decision? The necklace or the custom suit? For us, too many African Americans, we are enamored with the custom suit and we pass on the necklace when the necklace can appreciate and the suit depreciates. And that, I think that's because the suit <clears throat> makes us feel better. Makes us feel good, as you said. Yes, good. Um, so, how do, so what's the, with the reprogramming, right? So you talked about Dorothy Cotton. Um, what was the what was the techniques? What did she use? What was the psychological test that she you know exemplified to identify whether you had to be socially pro or reprogrammed? And then 
how did they do it? Well, they first want to know whether or not you really believe in nonviolence. They want to know your understanding of a social commitment and giving. And so then they will take you through classes. One of the most underappreciated aspects of a civil rights movement is the fact that they were, there were classes. Reverend Dr. Jim Lawson, Nashville Movement, they spent three months discussing, you go to, my, go to YouTube, you can see my interview with him. They spent three months talking about why they were meeting. Then they spent, spent three months discussing what they wanted to do. There was training. You wanted to be a freedom rider. You had to go through freedom rider workshops, SCLC, training. There was constant training. That's what is greatly missing is that uh, we are in desperate need of training. We need to have financial literacy training. We got to have self-esteem training. We've got to have entrepreneurship training. These things don't just happen. There must, there must be the training. We must take the, see, show, okay. Show me a church where the preacher has to beg for tithes and offerings. I will show you a church with a weak Bible study program. Man. But show me a church where the pastor does not have to beg, where they can take the collection before the sermon. <laughs> they can take a collection, pass in the envelopes, not even walking up. I will show you a church that is strong in biblical teaching because they have taught their members the word. And so the members don't have to be browbeaten to give because they have been trained and taught. That you know, is the big, we do not have enough training and teaching workshops. And so that's what we are missing right now in our community. It affects us across so at be for university man that's exactly what we're doing is that we believe exactly what you're saying is that there's not enough training there's not enough education there's not enough empowerment when it comes to our community and so and not just our community i think you know i think even i, I think that you know poverty transcend transcends race it actually thinks it's more about classism now i think the problem is that when you look at classism the people who make up the, the lower class are people who look like me and so how do we begin to rectify that? That has to be training. You know, we think it's funny that we got bad credit, but that's that's an ingredient for poverty. It's so right. hard. Well, well, because, well, because because see, three words connecting the dots. Even with credit, even with credit, even when we talk about it, we're not properly connecting the dots. Yep. When I had TV One's Washington Watch. I said, we're gonna do a whole hour on credit. My producer, Jay Feldman, Jay said, he's like, dude, that's not an hour. I said, yes, it is, trust me. He's like, I I'm sorry, I don't see it. I was like, well, I'm the host and managing editor, so it don't matter, because I make the final call. I'm telling you, we're gonna do it. Did the show, he was like, did. Was, he goes, man, that was like two, three hours. Yeah, like, I tried to tell you that. See, he was only looking at credit in a one dimensional way. Yeah. I was connecting the dots with credit in terms of trying to walk people through, um, in terms of how credit is weaponized. Yeah. How, how there were 25, 25 plus states where they factor in. And why did I understand that? Because when I graduated from college, well, actually I wasn't even graduated yet, I got interviewed by the Birmingham News. This is in 1991. All 16, I go interview with 16 different editors. Every single one's like, yo, we gotta hire this dude. The hardest dude. Shoe in. The HR department of the Birmingham News said we're not gonna hire him. The newsroom was like, what? Because Alabama had a law that allowed them to factor in the credit score before uh, they hired somebody. I had all the skill set. Well, I'm a college student, you get a credit card, stuff get all screwed up. But because of my credit score, they didn't hire me. 
Now, now, don't you know I ain't never let the Birmingham news forget how they screwed up passing on me <laughs> with all. Oh no, every chance I get when I give a speech, I rem I tell this story. I had people from Birmingham news like, oh man, he gonna tell that story again. I'm like, absolutely, because y'all screwed up. But what people gotta understand is that's the case with more than 25 states in the country where they allow to factor your credit score into your job. There are members of the military who cannot get a higher security clearance that's right. because of their credit score. That's right. The credit, the credit score impact. And see, this is when I really, really, really understood how crazy the credit score system is. First of all, you got three companies that won't even tell you what the algorithm is that explain what's going on. I can pull up my free credit score right now on freecreditscores.com free and go, hold up, why does Experian have a different number than the other two and how is I'm good over here, but great over here and fair over here? Because their algorithm, when I filed for bankruptcy, this when it really hit me. So I owed, I forgot how much I owed on my vehicle. I think I owed something like $15,000. I go through the bankruptcy. Guess what? In the bankruptcy, they don't put in what you owe on the car. They put in what the car is valued at. So I'm in the bankruptcy and all of a sudden they go, okay, you owe $15,000 on, on this Chrysler. I forgot 300 in whatever it was. They went, how many miles? Blue book value is 8,500. The number is 8,500. I went, seriously? <laughs> they said, yeah. I'm thinking I gotta pay back the full 15, 16. No, 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 no. It's the value. And what, so what was that? What was the 16 for? Interest rate. Mm -hmm. The interest rate I had on the car. So what's happening in black America, to your point, about credit scores, the reason so many of us are broke is because we literally are paying massive interest rates on cars. We're renting furniture and televisions. We are sitting here, uh, even if we do uh, get a home, how much we're paying is much higher because of the interest rates. So if we change, John Hope Bryant, Operation Hope, very good friend of mine, they've been really helping folk tremendously, raising their credit scores 70, 80, 100 points, because now all of a sudden, raising your credit score is freeing up your capital. So if you're only making $40,000 a year and your credit score is low, you actually are expending more money than you should if you focus on your credit score. Even if you're making 40, you're gonna have more money in your pocket because that interest rate is lower. That interest rate is now tight. Well, I can lower my interest rate. Now a sudden interest rate on, on, on the car. Now if so we gotta connect a dot for people to go, oh, hold up. So that impacts this? which impacts this, which impacts this. Yes, that one thing has a down effect on other pieces. Definitely. And uh, I think it goes even further. I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, you talked about was, you know, all three bureaus having different scores. Um, but I think credit is not just limited to your scores. I think it, it actually goes back to your credibility or your character. So one of the things that we teach is that credit is your character. So. You know, Roland, you know, you know, money don't have to be involved. So, you know, what kind of car you ride? I drive a, I drive a nav 2008 Navigator. I All bought right. my Navigator. Let me, tell, let me tell you something. I leased that. After I, went, I said, wait, I literally, guys, like, so what we doing? He said, we finance him? Nope. He said, we lease him? Nope. So what we doing? I said, we're going to negotiate this. I'm going to leave. I'll be back in 15 minutes with a cashier's check uh, to pay for it. Now, and riding again, to the wheels, so I literally drove it off the lot, paid for. Um, I now had it since 2008, uh, 169,000 miles. I'm good. Uh, remember, ego don't mean nothing to me. In fact, somebody actually really ticked me off when it happened. Keyed the left side of my car. Uh, okay, both both doors. I was not happy. Do you think I'm about to sit here and pay to get it repainted? and buff it out <laughs> that don't mean nothing to me it don't i it, li it literally don't i have a navigator where where the um um the the uh, the, the sideboards 
there, when you pull them, well, that it still works. Try said will be twenty five hundred for a new mower. I'm like, it's fine down. <laughs> so it's fine. Now. What? What? Why am I gonna give y'all twenty five hundred dollars? Okay, I need everybody listening to me. I drive it. It's red folks ride with me. It's on the right side. I don't drive on that side. It's ain't London. <laughs> So why am I going to spend $2,500 to have the other side go up every now and then and go down? Don't mean nothing. It's down. It's doing its job. If you get in, step on and get in. I'm not, I'm not tripping on that. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. I know some people, man, who would be going crazy. Oh, my God. It got keyed. I need to get it buffered. I need to get it repainted. I need to get this. Man, I'm not about to sit here and spend no five grand. On that, it don't mean that much to me. It's irrelevant to me. And that's what I'm saying, man. People are, are so caught up in this. I, I, I'm impressing somebody else. I remember when I had a Toyota, Toyota Corolla. I had two guys came from CNN, Chicago, to outfit my office to live streaming. And cab was late. I said, I'll take you to the airport. So we go out. Two white guys. One of them go. He said, man, I, I thought you had a BMW or Mercedes. I was like, why? I said, this guy four doors. It got four wheels and it's going to get y'all to the airport. And so we were talking and he was, I said, man, let me explain something to you. I said, I, I, I don't care about that. He, we literally, uh, I said, uh, I would go to a five-star hotel to a black tie event, driving this Toyota Corolla and give them the keys and walk in. I ain't got a problem. Now see somebody listening going, man, I don't know about that. Well, guess what? Ross Perot, the late Ross Perot. Again. Yes, sir. Who was worth three billion dollars? Billion. He drove a he drove a minivan. Now I draw the line at a minivan. <laughs> Warren Buffett. So I'm like, are you serious? Uh, the that that I was talking to another. Uh, I was talking to Jonathan Rogers, who was the founding CEO of TV One. He told me, and he was I forgot what he'd get it from. He said, the average millionaire owns four or five pair of shoes the millionaire next door yo do you know how many pair of shoes black people got we almost got a whole closet for shoes you can only wear one pair one time all i'm saying is that we have to we when you mentioned character what we have to, if we work on this and if we work on this, we work on value. The value ain't on what you got. The value was on the inside. When you are able to fortify yourself from the outside influences that are chattering, why are you wearing that? What, what's that? How much that cost? What's going on? Doc, you ain't even, you ain't even work. Susan Taylor. Susan said to me, Roland, she said, I go on vacation. I pack one small bag. And I'm just going to wash my clothes. I ain't trying to impress nobody. I have seen Susan has this, this flowing orange outfit. I have seen Susan at multiple black tie events. I know I've seen that outfit <laughs> 15 <laughs> times. And Susan said, I don't care. And it don't matter. Every time you see Susan Taylor, she looks like she's regal. She's a 75-year-old queen in the same orange outfit you have seen 15 times because she don't care what you think. She knows when she walks into the room, she's walking in her full confidence, her full prosperity, because she knows that orange outfit. So if you took a picture of her, like when she wore that at an event six months ago, she uh, whatever. Right? So this is what we got to fix. We got to build confidence in our children to say the clothes that ain't that that don't make you because guess what when you walk in your full confidence and when you walk into the room you can walk into the room with the same outfit you had on last week and they're gonna say who is that walking into the room i had my, my first wife as a reason his first wife because that means i was divorced uh once told me she she didn't particularly like how i there was an event for her her, her company 
and she didn't particularly like how I walked into the room. And so she felt I should have been, I should have had more deference to her white bosses. So when we got home, she said, you know, you, you walked into the room like you own it. I said, wow. I said, baby, I was way walk into a room like that. I said, you know who you married to? I said, because <laughs> that's exactly, I said, that's exactly how your husband's supposed to walk into a room. See, again, when you walk into a room in your full confidence, when you walk into your room with full prosperity, when you walk into a room knowing who you are and what God made you, guess what? When you walk in, they ain't looking at your clothes. They looking at your walk. So and when you do that, that's what defines you. Not y'all sitting here and you want to, you know, again, impressing somebody and all the accoutrements. Man, that stuff don't mean nothing to me. I remember I had to meet with this one dude, Doc. It was so funny. He was like, you know, my suit $5,000. My shoes are $700. My, my shirt is $300. And I'm telling y'all right now, I swore his whole outfit cost $150. What? Because no he, he looked cheap. Listen to what I just said. He was wearing $5,000 worth of clothing. Still looks I cheap. swore it wasn't worth 150 because he looked cheap. I was actually wearing between the suit and the shirt and the tie and the shoes. I was wearing $300 worth of clothes. He thought it was 5000 <laughs> <laughs> It's how you walk. It's your character. Now, you know, that's it's what you said about yourself. President Obama. He said, man, his walk. Look, no, just, I mean, just, it's, it's right. It's, it's, it's pre look, you can be, I've said this all the time, you can be present or you can have presence. Mm. When I'm present, you also feel my presence. That's so going back to your original question, when you have that freedom, you can walk a totally different way. You walk into boardrooms, you walk into church, you walk into grocery stores. Your whole walk is different because see, if you don't have all that, if you don't have debt, and self-doubt and all of that stuff weighing you down, all of that makes you smaller. Mm -hmm. When you lift all of that off of you, then you can absolutely walk upright. Mm. And you can you can walk, you can walk with a glide. Somebody told me, said, man, you you got a glide. You don't you you ain't got a walk, you got a glide. I like, sure do. <laughs> because I'm because I'm free. Free. Yeah, that's good. That's real good. So it's a compounding effect, though. So when you start looking at the fact that, you know, that we start off with the credit thing, right? But not only do we talk about, you know, your your prices, your interest rates, uh, you not being able to have a, you know, get the best of jobs, get the security clearances, uh, even your insurance is higher. Um, but then you got to go into the fact that now it also stops you from building wealth because now... Yes. I can't buy the rental property. I can't get the business loan to start the business. I can't buy inventory. I can't do the things that I know I want to do. I'm called to do. I wish I could do because I didn't take care of the thing that I should have managed better, which is my credit. And so now not only is it costing me more, but it's uh, financially, but it's also costing me also when it comes to my dreams, it's cost me to come to my purpose that ultimately relates right back around to your, to your finances, so it becomes a perpetuating cycle. How do we get out of the red race? Well, it starts with, like you said, number one, you gotta have the mindset to know that you're in the red race and the mindset to wanna get out, and then number two, have the training programs in the community that can take it to the next step, and that's what we're doing here at Be Free University, man. I'm so excited about it. I'm, yeah. I'm excited. It, 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 and I want people listening to understand uh, how, how, how basic this is. Um, I don't, and I, and, and again, I, I take it back to, I take it back to um, 
when my dad would say these things. And again, I knew what he wanted. Mm. And I knew he wanted the best. But my deal was, again, I was a kid going, you're bringing yourself down, talking about what you want because what you don't have. Mm. Whereas my whole deal is, I'm not going to bring myself down. I'm going appreciate where I am, what I got. And then if I respond to that, that's all good. So, and, 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 and that's so important because when you talk about bringing yourself down, man, it weighs on you. Yeah. You, 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 you wake up and you go to sleep and it's the worry that's on you and you, you just, and, and, and you're fretting and you, whereas for me, and I'm just being real, I see something, man, that looks great. How much is that? No, I can't afford that. Okay. Would like to have it. Can't afford it. And not going to kid myself to do it. Look, I am not a car person. I'm not a car person. I know some people, they just, all about car. Man, I don't care. I've had a Mazda Miata, a Mazda B2200 pickup truck. Uh, I've had uh, 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 a Chrysler 300M. Uh, I've had the Navigator. I've had a Chevy Equinox. I, I, whatever. Okay, whatever. I'm, I, I am happy with what my money is able to buy me because it's getting me what I need. But my dream car, my absolute dream car is a Viper. Really? Dream car. What color? I'm talking about, I'm ta- oh, black on black. <laughs> okay. I'm black. All my women been black. <laughs> my family black. All my stuff black. It's all black. Let me plug this computer up. But it was a Viper. And I look at the Viper in the magazine. I look at it. I love Viper. Viper is going to cost probably 100000 plus. I could have bought the Viper by now. I could. But had I bought the Viper, it would have creeped. Listen to me, people. Listen to me very clearly. I could. I can afford. Listen. listen. I can afford the Viper. I can buy the Viper. But I don't want. Well, I can't afford. Let me go back. I can buy the Viper. But I can't afford the stress buying the Viper. What comes with it. Because I am not going to buy the Viper on credit. If I buy the Viper, I'm paying cash. And I told myself the only way I will buy the Viper is if I am making $2 million a year for three consecutive years, then I'll buy it. That's, and again, that's discipline. If I never in my life, if I never, if I never in my life am able to own a Viper, I'm good. I'm happy. I'm content. But what I'm not going to do is create angst and a level of stress by dropping money over here when I can use this to build my business, do things for my nieces, things, do stuff with my wife. And so again, that's where I'm, what I'm saying how we have to look at our decisions of like, cool. Man, I could do that, but it's going to re- result in this, this, this. Well, you, I think you're saying you're not going to sacrifice your freedom. Absolutely not. I absolutely will not. And in fact, this tripped me out because it didn't hit me until about a month after I got it. Uh, in December, in December, I talked to my CFO and I uh, got the account. We had a very good year. He said, you going to get hit with taxes. He said, you had too good of a year. I was like, dang. All right. <laughs> What's the options? So he then said, he said, all right. So we start going through, what can we pay off? He, he, said, he said, whatever your services are, you can pay those a year in advance. You can pay them before the year's out, which means that all my, my server cost, associated press, other things like that, I could pay for that upfront in 2020 get the tax write-off, 
uh, and then I'll have the monthly bills in 2021. Great, let's do that. We were moving to, we going to, I knew we were moving to a new place. I could do the same thing with rent from my office. We were moving to a new place in April, so I said, well, I can't do it now, but I'll do it in 2021. So then I said, well, buy a vehicle. Well, I knew we, would, we needed you know, all our traveling and stuff. And so the, the, uh, this accountant says, well, we can write up 100% of the vehicle. I was like, all right. So I was, I was going to get an actual SUV. I knew it was going to cost me anywhere from eighty five dollars to $100,000, what we needed, the large one. So then I was I talk, talking to my team. I was like, well, you know, we're traveling a lot. You know, we've got live, live vehicles and stuff like that. And we can do, it was kind of like, hmm, I can do that. We do that. Uh, and then it was like, well, what can we do? So, we, so we're talking. We're talking. And so then we start talking about having live vehicle deal. So then all of a sudden, I looked at the travel. So that's what I'm looking at Mercedes Sprint. Now, mind you, I had never even contacted the idea of a sprinter. You know, talk about it, what we look like, what we, what we can do. Uh, it can allow us to travel. Uh, we can actually get a broadcast, like all those different things. And then, okay, got it. Got it. Makes sense. But then, literally, it was a Friday. I was like, all right, done. Pull the trigger. Call the office. Same thing. Roland was not buying anything with credit. None against it. Other people would say, hey, Roland, you could have got your low, low interest rate. No, I ain't want to do all that. Because what did I what, Remember what I said? Freedom. Freedom. I did not. Uh-uh. Nope. So I sat there and I was like, no, it's not going to happen. So uh, made the decision. 188000 It didn't hit me until a month later. I said, that's the first Mercedes I've owned. Mm. But listen, folks. That was a tax write-off. Mm. That was a business cost. Yeah. See, so see again, a lot of folk are running out, kill themselves for the Mercedes, and it was it for them. It was a it was a it, it's a personal deal. They ain't writing it off. I get the tax benefit of it, and that's how we write. Say it again, man, and that's it. So. um yeah, I, 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 I drive a Mercedes, but I don't own one. Let's say it again. I fully, drive a Mercedes, fully, but I don't own one. Yeah, a fully customized printer, a whole crew. We can live stream from it. That's everything that we need. Again, I could have killed myself to buy one when I was 30. I didn't get my first Mercedes until I was 52. But it's wow. a tax write-off. It's a tax write-off. This decision. Man, that tax structure, you know, I had a, a conversation earlier today with Damon John, and one of the things that he was talking about when it comes to building wealth is that he was talking about the first thing that millionaires and billionaires look is they want to raise, they want to increase their, their, their income. They don't go start another business. They try to find more ways to cut taxes, you know? Yes. So, you know, and so, you know, I believe that the wealth looks something like this. I believe the wealth is passive income plus dividends minus taxes. If I can find mm -hmm. a way to get passive income, um, that is, a, you know, a business that pays me. I put my money to work. My money, you know, makes me money. Uh, I find a way to get dividends. That is that I get it something. I own something, whether it's stock or real estate. I have I ownership something that is going to pay me in dividends. Well, then I automatically go into a, a lower tax bracket, especially if I have a good tax strategist. We don't teach that in our communities. We don't teach well, like you just said, no. like well, what you just said, like you can get you can get the car. And, and let it be a tax write-off. But I got a I got an educator over here named Flame that'll put you on game in a minute. He's like, hey, listen, that's what he teaches. That's that's the whole game. That's I don't know if you heard him clapping a minute ago, but that's that was the one person in the whole audience that was clapping when you said there was a tax write-off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because see, here's here's what. Okay, so let so so people under, so people understand. I, I I'll have people who say stuff, man. That's what stuff white folks do. Well, hell, everything that's in America is created by white people. But everything in America is created by white people. Everything. White people create the tax structure. Why am I going to sit here? I'm like, no, let me figure out. Y'all been using it. I'm going to figure out how to use it too. But that, that's it, Roland. Like, we want to go around the system. That Listen, man, the system was made to prosper. If we learn the games, we can play it too. Look, the great, look, I, I'm not into real estate, but the reason Don, all that crap Donald Trump did, because the tax structure benefits real estate more than any other industry, any That's other. Why I thought you. I, no. I had somebody. I, I had somebody. To, I had to tell somebody this, and they they didn't get it. They really didn't get it. But I had to really unpack it for them. I said, "Do you?" I said, "Do y'all understand?" The person was like, "Man, I I I am not gonna sit there, man, and 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 pay the dude to do my taxes." I said, "Fool." I said, "Fool, you gonna sit there and try to labor?" 
trying to figure all that out. I said, don't you know when you pay somebody to do your taxes, it's a tax write-off? Not the net. You're high. Well, I said, you're a high professional. Exactly. God, David, I said, this ain't what I do. This ain't well, what I do. I don't want to throw no names out there, but there are some places that you should. The ones in the corner, they got the little statues and they wave another things. The ones that got the ones with the signs, and they spin them around. No, go get you a strategist. Go get you somebody that's yeah. what they do. They know the tax code. Not they putting it in a computer and they just going to punch a couple buttons and they're going to spit it out. No, somebody who's going to sit down with you, ask right. you questions, structure your companies, structure your entities, and then tell you, hey, you can send your kid to college. It's going to be a tax write-off. Hey, you can actually go over here and put this scholarship in. It's going to be a tax write-off. Hey, did you know you can hire your children? It can be a tax write-off. Hey, did you not know that you can give your kids a car and they can drive it? You put, a, put the... Um, what you call a wrap on the car. Now they're driving the marketing uh, for the, uh, so many different strategies that we can Man, use my right in front of us that we don't use. My 24 year old niece works for me. You ain't going to be sitting there asking me for no money. You're going to do some work. But right the, on. I mean, it's, 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 but again, though, we, we're sitting, we're, we're, but, but again, what happens is, but it's also, it's fear. See, we, we, we operate. I remember I spoke to, the Bryan, Texas Housing Department. Where's I'll never that? forget. Bryan, Texas. Okay. Um, but it's a uh, Bryan College I Station, not, about 90 minutes, 90 minutes from Houston. I went to Texas A&M. That's what college, Bryan, Bryan College Station is. Okay. So here's what was interesting. So I'm, I'm presenting this whole deal, and we, and we were talking about saving, investing, how we look at money, what we spend on. And his sister, she's like, she said, sir, I don't want you to tell me I ain't got no money. I said, yes, you do. She said, look, I ain't got no money. She says, I'm broke. I said, no, nah, that, that ain't true. She says, you talking about saving a dollar a week. I ain't got that. I said, I got a question for you. That soda, that, that, that soda, soda water in your hand. Some people call it pop. How much that costs? She says, what do you mean? I said, the bottle of soda in your hand. How much did that cost? She said, $1.79. I said, did you have to drink soda? Could you have saved your $1.79 and drank water? She was like, what do you mean? I said, you told me you have no money. Would you spend $1.79 on that bottle of Dr. Pepper, whatever it was? I said, your savings could have started. With that one dollar and seventy nine cents. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. She, I said, I need you to change this. I need you to start looking at around you what you spend money on. I said, I need you to again going back to the Jordash jeans, the polo shirts, the designer stuff. What are you spending money on? What? Where is your money going? How important is that? I'm not saying just deprive yourself, but the reality is you didn't have to drink that bottle. Mm -hmm. I was just trying to break, again, break this thing down as small as possible. And it, it hit her that she realized, man, I spent money on that. Now it's, oh, I spent money on these chips. I spent money on these cookies. I spent money on this. Then these two, how much money am I spending going out versus me cooking at home? Yes, and sir. Simply preparing my food and putting it in packages and then taking it in for lunch. So, all, so now that then goes to uh, the next thing in terms of what am I spending on shoes and what am I spending on clothes? So I got money. Where is my money going? Tracking your expenses. And so, and that's the piece where we begin. And, but again, we have to, again, put that thing in my head. My wife and I raised six of my nieces at different times. We had six of them all at one time. And I remember after church, uh, I, I normally, this is pre-COVID, I'm gone every weekend. I, I, I am never at home. I'm talk, I might be at home five weekends out of, out of, out of the uh, country. Wow. This particular weekend, I'm home. She was traveling. And I'm giving speeches and I'm covering stuff. So she, so she, so she was speaking somewhere that weekend. I had the girl, six nieces, and we navigated. Church over. Uncle Roro, where we going to eat? I said we ain't going to eat nowhere. She was like, well, don't only at the church on jacket take us out. I said, well, I ain't on jacket. 
we go home. It's six of y'all. I first started cooking when I was seven. I said, so y'all gonna figure out how to cook? I said, let me break this thing down for y'all. I said, it's six of y'all. It's me. That makes seven. I said, if we go out, the average cost of the meal between the appetizers and the entree and the drink is going to be $20 each. I said, 20 out. times seven is $140. I said, sure. you put in the 18 cent tip. I said, 18% tip. I said, I'm about to sit here and spend $150 on y'all going out to eat. I said, that's every month Sunday. I said, that's $600 a month, $700 a year. Yeah. I said, now, y'all got, I said, I said, because I said, y'all got three tutors. Do you know how much your tutors cost? I said, this is how much your tutors cost. I said, each one of y'all have an Apple laptop computer. That laptop was $2,000 each times six. I said, it's $12,000. I said, so the cost of going out to eat is the cost of three of y'all having a new laptop computer. I said, now we can go to the store and we can spend 40 to $60 on food that can actually last for the next three Sundays. I said, so if I spend $60, let's say I spend $75 <laughs> on food that y'all can eat in a meal for the next three Sundays, but y'all wanna go out where I'm gonna spend $450 on three Sundays. I said, I want you to do the math. Which one makes sense? And we're driving. And then they start thinking. Now, mind you, I'm throwing numbers out, but I'm making them also add. Because mm. I needed them to take ownership of the money. So when I, I said, so if we spend $80 on food to cook, and it's going to cost $450 taking y'all out, I then said, so when y'all want to go out bowling or whatever, where that money going to come from? Now I got them thinking. I said, so the money to go for y'all to go out to, for the amusement park is going to come from the money we saved not going out to eat. You can't do both. You're not going to go out to eat every single Sunday. And you're going to go to the amusement park. And I'm paying for your tutors. And I'm paying for your laptops. I said, you got to make a decision. So I started forcing them to make decisions. I started taking my niece's grocery shopping. If, if you're a parent out there, stop leaving your kids at home when you shop. Why? Your kids need to see you calculating three for $2 versus one for $2.59. You gotta, they need to see that. They need to see how you make decisions on what to buy. That's no, right. grapes right now are too high. We gonna get some oranges and some green apples. I'm gonna wait till the cost of the grapes go down. They got to see and hear that. Cause they gonna say, well, mama and dad, why are you doing that? Because we, because guess what? We are not in season. So the reason that's why they're so high. I'm not paying that. They have to see that. The problem that we have is we are shielding our children from the yeah. daily financial things happening. Yep. And so the reason they go up, grow up, having no clue about money is that we never actually expose them to the mechanics of life. And then that's why these Gen Z's and millennials today still living their ass at home at 35 because they never had a real understanding of what adulting means. And so they sitting here thinking that as a 30 year old, they supposed to have the same stuff you got as a 55 Say it again, year old, man. or a 60 year old, and you should be saying, your ass ain't work for none of this. <laughs> so you, can't, you can't have the 82 inch TV and you can't have all of this because you ain't done the problem. So they're trying to sit in here like, oh my God, I'm, 80, I'm, getting, I'm broke. No, because the problem is you order in DoorDash and Uber Eats all dog on day. Yeah, Get delivery fee because yo ass ain't learn how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> so if you taught your kids how to cook after church on Sundays when they are 10 and 11 and 12, they not going to grow up eating out all day, ordering Uber Eats and DoorDash. They going to understand if I prepare my meals, I'm going to have more money to spend because I'm not spending my money eating out all the time. That's it. That simple decision with my nieces at that age 
impacts the decisions when they turn 18, 20, 22, and 24. But if you don't, they are 24 year old person. You like, I don't understand why these kids don't get it. They don't get it because you never taught them. That's right. Well, I believe that, you know, that, that finance is 80% mental is 20% actually financial. We say it like this, that poverty is a mindset, broke is a temporary condition. If you can change your mind, you can change your money. And so we really believe that, that literally that, you know, if you change your mind about money, money will change his mind about you and stick around for a whole lot longer. Uh, but you got to first have that mindset shift. So, uh, yeah. Roland, I, I see y'all in the chat. Somebody said he, somebody, he calling me out on the door dash. I'm telling you, man. <laughs> it, 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 and I just know. He in the chat too, yo. He in the chat too. Oh, no, 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 no. I multitask now. I see <laughs> I, this, 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 is, this, this is real simple because I'm telling somebody, who, somebody who's sitting here and trying to figure it out and like, man, this is too complicated. No, it's not. This is just real basic. And this is where I want you to start. I want you, I want, I want you to, I want whoever's listening, I want you to not buy, I want you, I want you to record, every time you buy a snack, I want you to decide if you're buying soda, if you're buying chips, if you're buying cookies, I want you to say, I'm going to write down in my little note section of my app. That's right. Then I want you to do so for one week, this is y'all homework, for one week, I want you to just write down, don't, nothing else, no, no, I want you to write down. Um, Snapple or soft drink or chips and cookies or candy bar, whatever it is. But you record that down for a week and then tabulate how much you spend. Then the next week, I want you not to do that two days, just two. You can do it for three. Well, I don't know when you do it, but don't do it for two. Then I want you to go look at the comparison. What I spent five days a week or seven, depending on what you, then what I spent not doing for two days what the savings was. I guarantee you, you're going to then realize, well, man, if I cut that back four days a week, three days a week, two days a week, one day a week, all of a sudden, the savings over here goes up. Now you apply that to the other aspects of your life. I think we, I think we make it hard for people. Joe Madison has a great comment, uh, Doc. He says, you got to put it where the goats can get it. Put it with the old goat. country phrase. You got to put it where the goats can get it. Make it reachable. Goats don't eat here. Goats eat down there. Mm. When you make it that simple and you walk people through, then they realize, oh, yo, man, I, last week I saved $6. Next week. Let's save 12. Well, man, if I, I, now let's save 30, let's save 40, let's save 100. Most people, my great, the greatest, one of my great slogans came from the movie Hootlum, Lawrence Fishburne, playing Buppy Johnson. That's what he said. He said, you don't know what you don't know. That's right. A lot of us just don't know. I am not a financial expert. My parents never went to college. We didn't have these things, but I paid attention. I went through stuff and experienced it. But then what I did was after I experienced it and I shifted, I then forced the shift on my family. Mm. I went to my family and I said, mind you, I got four, bro four one brother, three sisters. So between them, my parents are still living around. We got, you know, we got 20 people. I said, listen, we ain't, do, we, we ain't doing this family crap crap, this family Christmas crap. I said, we gonna come together as a family and enjoy each other's company. Yeah. And the kids in your family, buy them gifts. Stop buying gifts for other family members. That was one. When my parents moved into my house. They wanted to convert one of the bathrooms to a stand up. At first I was like, man, y'all living there. I said, fine. But then I called them and said, no, you're doing that. I was like, what? I said, no, you're not doing that. I said, I just paid off two thirds of y'all debt. Mm. I said, y'all moved from, da from Houston to Dallas. I paid off two thirds of your debt. I paid your car off. I said, this is the closest that you've been to debt free in your life. I'm not going to let y'all incur more debt because you want a stand up shower, which was something that you always wanted in your own home. And now you want to get it. No, no, no. 
moving you here allowed you to live at a lower cost of living because you don't have to pay a mortgage or rent. I said, y'all not going to do it. As the child, I'm telling my parents that because I, listen to y'all, because I needed my parents who retired early to know what it's like to live freely and not under the oppressive debt that they lived through my entire life. So sometimes you got to make a decision for somebody else and it might be your parents. That lose y'all? I think I'm still here. I don't see y'all. There hey, you Steven, go. Now, can you hear me? now I see you. Can you hear me? Listen, uh, y'all hire my company to handle your video stuff next time. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I I'll tell you what. I tell, I'll, tell you what. You. I'm gonna tell I you. I want to do this again. I want to do this every quarter. Uh, the next time we do it, I want you to MC it for me. That's fine, but we can handle your back end. Trust me. Well, we we we, we don't want to put nobody out of no position. Now they they're black. That's fine. People. That's, that's fine. We'll, we'll we'll teach them. Don't worry about it. Come on, <laughs> I'm like, hey, now that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Come in, teach them. You know, and so we can keep a black company still in business and we can still, you know, have you come out and I want to have you come EC uh, this thing. And uh, we want we want to take this every every we want to do this every quarter and every quarter. I want this to get better and better and better. And uh, man, who else can who, who else can MC something like this other than you, bro? I, 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 you, you game? That's fine. Let's roll. Oh, let's roll with it, man. Listen, we got to get out of here. They about to kick us out. So. Uh, we got to go, man, but I thank you so much for your time. Thanks for often taking my invitation. I'm going to tell you now that you got the baddest team in the industry. I'm going to let you, we, we called you on Monday, I mean on Friday, and had, we had you booked by, by Monday, and everything else went, man, it's been crystal clear and clear. Thank you for operating cool. excellence in our community. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Yeah, thank, enjoy. You, thank you so much.